le monde, c'est nous. The year 2022 is culminating and the world in Africa in particular prepared to enter the new year 2023 with so much vitality and great prospect for the coming year. A lot happened across the African continent from social, economic and especially our political spheres. A series of events characterize Africa. Aspects like governance, the role of democracy, election financing, and a good security, elections, uh, inflation, geopolitical change, no game, and the plight of half territory across Africa, among others, all characterize the atmosphere in Africa. Aside these, a wide a wind of change or the report of the African consciousness ignited the fight against new colonialism and for Africa to show itself well at the international arena and of course enter partnership of cooperation that will help give impetus to the economic trajectory of the continent. So today we ask in this question how careful can African leaders, stakeholders, civil society and other actors ensure that the year 2023 marks a turning point uh, again in Africa. Of course, uh, this is on the continent, gentlemen. And of course, looking at the, the uh, 2022 in uh, rich spread, uh, focusing on the events that characterize the continent, you are most welcome. <laughs> coming to an end uh, but today we want to look at the major events uh, that characterized uh, the african uh, continent uh, in uh, the year 2022 hearing in the preamble we hear of course uh, the world is waiting to welcome the new year 2023 but then we want to analyze the major trends or trends that uh, uh, happened across the african continent we talk things like democracy the role of law and other we're looking at elections we are looking at series of coup d'etats we are looking at the tension uh, between uh, 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 the former colonial power that is france and mali and of course we are also looking at the geopolitical game uh, that uh, came again to the fore uh, in the 21st century these are the factors that we are analyzing today in the program views on the continent to see how africa uh, can uh, of course enter the year 2023 uh, with great prospects to see how the continent can position itself and of course bring practical solutions to the uh, problems affecting the African continent. You are most welcome and uh, this is Views on the Continent and of course this is the last uh, program for the year 2022. Uh, with delight uh, I'll be uh, introducing to you uh, the panel this day that will analyze uh, this very important topic 2022 in retrospect what to learn and of course what prospect for the new year we are going to meet uh, mr elijah inoko a researcher with leaks university on african uh, development hello to you sir and thanks for joining us this day to look at uh, the major events that characterize the atmosphere in africa and of course what expectations for the coming year hello clarice and uh, hello to hello viewers of Africa media <clears throat> it's been a dramatic year for support and uh, just like you've listed on your list there it's been a, a year like no other i would say by a few years that i've been looking at development in africa the kind of things that have been happening on the continent and the kind of events just not just from a, a geopolitical perspective from what the african leaders themselves are realizing that you know they have a role to play in the, in the world stage and they can actually um, make themselves to be heard or present their facts in a way that the world can actually listen to them. You know, one that sticks out to me, like you already mentioned, is about the war in Ukraine. Whoever needs the whole Bible, well, the African leaders can have a cohesive position on the war in Ukraine. Because in the past, we've seen them being told left and right and say, you have to support this, you have to support this. This time, the studio are trying to say, hey, no, nobody's going to be dictating to us. We need to take a unified position here. So. I would say it's been a dramatic year. And, uh, thanks for having me in the show today. We've been having a full discussion about this. 
having you, Mr. Elijah Inwaku. Indeed, uh, it is very imperative to continue to talk and to see like you have on the line. There is need for Africa to take advantage also of, of the happenings across the world and position itself uh, uh, itself better. And uh, with uh, delight, uh, I will also say welcome to Mr. Emmanuel Ndiom. He's joining us today to give his own insight on this very important topic uh, to reiterate uh, that he is a political uh, analyst and also an instructor. Hello to you, Mr. Ndiom. A pleasure having you this day. Yeah, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, please. Uh, I must say I'm delighted to be on your platform. Uh, given the fact that we are talking about major events that marked the African continent, I want to start with the most striking major event, which is the existence of my life. Indeed. That I'm still existing till this moment is a major event for me, for Africa and for Cameroon. Because as a son of the soil, if I were not able to get up or to be existing till this day, it wouldn't have been, I would not have been opportuned to, you know, make this ret retrospect. And okay. I think the retrospect is it, it, so vast, but we will try to go with the one that we can go. Because, in, in, of indeed, course, indeed, it, it, it's it, been more. Indeed, um, Stanzium, it's actually vast, but then... All, uh, one thing is certain that we are going to analyze constructively and touch some very particular aspects which we think uh, that have a role to play uh, in uh, the development of the continent Africa because we have mentioned in the prayer some of the aspects like insecurity could talk, but then uh, we also share the viewpoint of some pundits who think that the uh, economic development of the continent Africa will go a long way to curtail some of the instances of insecurity occurring across the continent of Africa, the cradle of humanity. And of course, uh, let, let's go straight away uh, to the analysis while uh, reminding our panelists that this is an uh, informative program. Uh, you can watch us on Facebook, uh, Afric Media TV. And of course, uh, you can uh, uh, drop your comments of what you think. What do you think are some of the major events uh, that occurred in Africa? And of course, what advice can you give uh, uh, those at the forefront as the continent prepares to enter the year 2023? We start with you, uh, Mr. Elijah uh, in, in Noaku. Uh, let's have a quick view. How did you perceive uh, the year 2022? I want to uh, cite the coronavirus and every <coughs> other thing. But then, uh, in, uh, in your own perspective, uh, how can you define the year 2022 bringing in the African context? Well, it's good. Well, you mentioned about the uh, coronavirus, but um, I want to say the year 2022 for Africa has been, I would say, a good year, to be honest with you. Let's begin from what you just mentioned. You talked about the coronavirus. Look at the whole world. Uh, there was uh, forecasting that people are going to be, corpses are going to be on the streets of Africa. That's what we saw pundits in the Western world saying, you know, Africa is going to be carrying corpses all over the place. But we saw the opposite. The United um, UNESCO and the other World Health Organization, they are kind of shocked and Asking the question, how did Africa escape from this COVID-19 that we don't see people dying the way they are dying? We are blessed in Africa. Let me just say that. We have, I'm not a medical doctor, but I can tell you that the high temperatures that we have in Africa, the coronavirus couldn't survive in that high temperature. So I would say it's a, ble it's a blessing thing for Africa to say that we actually went through this. But the downside of it is the fact that you know, um, the COVID-19, the world is becoming a global village. And... Logistically speaking, the effect of COVID-19 in one part of the world actually affected Africa negatively. You're seeing uh, prices of things going up because the supply chain has been disrupted. You see the war in Russia and all these other things. But as a whole, to be honest with you, I want to be on the positive note that 2020 has not been a bad year. As a whole, if you look at what's happening in the world, this has been a year where Africans have opened their eyes to the reality of what they can do. This has been a year that Africans have stood their grounds. This has been a year that Africans are able to challenge their colonial masters. Every day we talk about France and what's happening in the African continent. And whoever knew the African can stand up and say, hey, we are not more, you know, in the colonial area. We are cardinals. We can work as cardinals. You know, the world stands up to condemn Africa in terms of who the and all one of Africa. Africans say, hey, 
wait a minute, we can take our own destiny at our own, into our own hands. They might be cool here, but we think that these people can lead us one way or the other. You know, there are tensions, geopolitical tensions, inflation all over the world, but Africa is surviving. You know, Africa is showing some really resiliency that the world has never seen before. People thought that Africa is going to be buckled up on their knees. Yes, we do see challenges on the continent. Yes, we do see issues on the continent. We do see the consequences of the war. We do see inflation. We do see the tension. We do see geopolitical issues happening here and there. So, oh, the continent's not on its knees. People are able to pick up themselves and say, we're better off. We can do better than this. So, to be honest with you, I see Africa coming out of this with a platform that can energize them to pick up 2023 and write their own future. To pick up 2023 and design their own future. Pick up 2023 and become leaders on the governing table of the Britain World Institution and not be beggars. I see Africa stand up and say, hey, all these draconian loans that we are taking, why is the West having loans at 2% and Africa is having the same loan at 20%? Why is it that? Why is that so much unfairness in the world? I see the voice of some people coming up, being able to articulate their own position and say, we cannot be at the same position. I see Africans standing up at the, uh, uh, the United Nations Security Council and asking for a position on the table and say, we cannot just be voters who are having a secondary opinion. We have to be there to give veto power to say, no, this goes against the interests of Africa. We can veto this and it shouldn't progress along the, along the table. Because right now, Africa doesn't have any veto power. Anything can be voted, anything can be decided. And we just have to be on the receiving end to take it. But at this stage, I think the continent is ready, you know, to do what the French might say, run the ball. Yeah, enough is enough, and we're ready to take the ball by the hand. I think that is the way I see Africa emerging from 2022 into 2023. to have your own impression about the year 2022, especially focusing uh, on Africa. Why not? Uh, we are not actually relegating what happened or the events that happened at the international uh, uh, arena, but then we want to look at 2022 and the African context. Well, 2022 in the African context, I would say, like I said when I took the mic the first time, yeah. uh, that we are, you and I are talking in this today is already a sign that is um, uh, a major mark in our life, and that we are able to look across Africa and still see some governments whom we thought at this point in time were supposed to have gone off is still a major mark of event in Africa. Now when you, I want to cue from where uh, uh, my brother Elijah Enuaku uh, ended there. He talked about seeing in, uh, an Africa that was capable of coming out of its troubles or its difficulties and standing tall. I want to say I corroborate, but it could not be up to 70% because uh, all what we are saying here today is a summary of what we have been saying throughout the whole year about Africa. We have been giving solutions, we have been criticizing dictatorial governments, and we still discover that uh, one major problem Africa actually faced, I want to start by uh, highlighting this major problem that Africa faced in 2022, is this problem of uh, democracy, this problem of democracy of which I've always been for the fact that if Africa in the 21st century cannot be able to readapt this word democracy, then they should maintain it as democracy. That is replacing the C with a Z. Why do I say so? We have seen if you look across the African continent with the number of coup d'etats that have taken place, it's a sign that our democracy has failed or we have not actually adapted it to the existing environments in Africa. 
Because if this were so, uh, the, the issue of the several coup d'etats, a lot of military rule, a lot of uh, disagreements in Africa that have tend to like, look at the solution to come only from the part of the gun. We can talk about uh, Mamadou Dumbuya, we can talk about Asimi Goita. Of course, that is a point where we think, uh, according to my brother um, Enoku, that nobody ever thought Africa could stand up to resist the Western world. And it happened in 2022. As we are scoring it a mark, let's also be asking ourselves, as we are standing to resist, to resist them using guns, where are those guns coming from? How much have we spent in this 2022 to procure these guns to fight the colonial master? If you look at it in summary, you will discover that uh, at one point this morning I was reading a document about uh, the Sudanese government voting that is 6.600 million US dollars just for their military operations in, uh, in, in, in a period of four months. Then you tend to ask yourself, was there no other better method to have handled such things so that we could invest such amount into the economic and infrastructural development of the continent? I mean, you discover that in the course of this, human resources have been lost. Human lives have been lost. Human, yeah, human capital and the financial capital that Africa so much needs at this point in time, more than any other continent, when you strike a bank, you discover that we have been running at a loss. Despite the fact that you stand up to fight somebody whom you call a colonial master, in the course of the fighting, let's evaluate what have we lost in terms of fighting such a person. Because, like I've always said, in a war, the two warring factions, they never win. Nobody wins a war. The only body who wins a war is the arms dealer. And that arms dealer who wins a war will surely have a spirit or a phantom somewhere that should be manipulating so that the wars should continue. So I want to think that instead of appreciating ourselves, making appraisal that we will be able to fight the colonial master, let's be asking ourselves as we are facing out of 2022, after engaging in many battles across the continent, what has been the benefit? It is true, we can pride ourselves that we never knew that before now we could st stand up and, and, and fight back, and fight back. And I think as we are asking that question, the most interesting part of it should be, have we been able to fight as a collective person or we have been able to fight as an individual? I think that's the biggest question the African continent should be asking herself as we face out of 2022. Because no one said it was ever going to be easy. But then we could make it easier if we put our heads together and we put our thinking caps completely. And of course, uh, your last uh, statement uh, comes in line uh, with uh, the question uh, which, uh, of course, I was about to, to ask about uh, how Africa can uh, come uh, as, uh, as one in order to attain or to meet uh, the uh, uh, expectations of the year 2023. Uh, coming back to you, Mr. Elijah Enoku, let's look at uh, Africa. Uh, of course, you uh, highlighted the, the, the successes that the continent Africa has recorded uh, so far or in the year 2022. But then uh, uh, there are some people feel like it is still more in uh, theory than in practice. So what do you think can be done uh, to bring Africa together, especially under the body of uh, the, the African Union? You mentioned it to practically uh, solve the, the issues affecting the African continent. Mr. Nzum uh, pointed out something which is very important. In the year 2020, they talked about silence in the guns, but we are in 2022 and there is still the proliferation of guns. So what do you think eh, can be done practically in coming year 2023 to avert or to curtail this uh, guns uh, proliferation and also to see that Africa comes together as one to strike a balance and of course brings African solutions to the problems affecting Africa. To create a few things here, sir. 
you know, we are very clear on separating apples and bananas. <clears throat> when it comes to the wars that are going on in Africa, they are distinctly different set of wars. If you are talking about a civil war that is going on in the country between different parties, that is a disservice to Africa as a whole. There's no doubt about that. But if we are talking about fighting imperialism, fighting imperialism, standing up to the oligarchs that are coming from the West and imputing their Western ideals, stealing the resources of Africa, impugning poverty on the people, that is not a civil war. If you look at the war in Burkina Faso, you look at the issues in Mali, when the people rise up against imperialism, they are saying, we are tired of puppet leadership. We are tired of French policies being implemented upon us. We giving, it's like you're saying, <clears throat> somebody will come to your house, give you a loan, give you an aid, but behind the aid, there are strings attached. All your gold is attached to it. All your silver is attached to it. All your bonds are attached to it. All your economy is attached to it. The president of one country is attached to it. The minister. Does it make sense that in the 21st century, African countries, the president of African country will go to France to approve the list of ministers and supposed to appoint ministers? Does it make any sense? Because I say no. It doesn't make sense in this 21st century. <clears throat> so let's separate civil wars fighting among ourselves and standing up to imperialism. Those are two different things here. Of course, when it comes to guns, we wish as Africans that there were no guns in the street. We wish as Africans that they were not killing ourselves. We're not using, you know, drawing a national budget that's going to be 50% on arms, arms deals. We wish that that wasn't happening. But let me tell you this. Freedom is not even on a platter of gold. And number two, there is no real <clears throat> independence without economic independence. It doesn't matter how you look at it. You can call all African countries that are independent but as we know, the way they are today, they are not. You cannot have independence without economic independence. If you're saying economically dependent on the West, you are still colonized. That is what Africa was fighting in 2022 and beyond. And if we see any iota of that, we see that people are standing up to these Western oligarchs that are coming to confronted with the resources of the continent. And they say, no, enough enough. There's nothing wrong with that as long as we're not killing ourselves. It must be resistance to make sure that people, we have the right to what we own. We can produce, we can explore, we can transform our own raw materials within our own territory. Now, on the question that you asked me, it is true that African leaders have to come here as one. You know, if you listen to the speech that made by all the various African presidents that was Washington, D.C. recently, you could see that there, there was some unanimity in what they're trying to say. All of them will say, let the products that are produced in Africa, whether they are raw materials, they are secondary materials, or they are minerals, let there be a semi transformation of those products on the continent of Africa before it's going out, because that's where we get killed economically. That's where we got killed to get to the Take rubber, for example. If you see how much, when the process of transforming rubber, when you produce that rubber in Canada, where you guys are, before it is being transported out here, why can't we transform it into semi finished product? Because when that is transported out here, finish here, it will be so more than 20 times the cost back to us in Africa. So that came from there. If African president can speak in one language, have a common platform on the aspirations of what they want, I was very satisfied with this uh, summit that they had with Joe Biden because they spoke in one voice. Paul Bia spoke, it was the same thing. Kagami spoke, it was the same thing. South African president spoke, it was the same thing. It's as if they had a common agenda. That is how it's a unity is strength. When you are united. United and you have all these, you know, this one is doing something. I've always said on many platforms, Twitter, you know, free media, or you know, the media that I provided. Africa has three major challenges. It doesn't matter how you dissect it, it's education. It is security, it is food. These are major challenges that are facing the country. And if we can, African can galvanize a core platform, the level of African Development Bank, 
whether at the level of the African, uh, the African Union, whether at the level of the United Nations Security Council, whether at the level of the British institutions, the IMF, and the World Bank, if Africa can galvanize a common platform and speak as one voice, when I say speak as one voice, because we see what's happening in Africa today. You have African countries, for example, South Africa, that are within the BRICS zone. The BRICS zone is of uh, Russia, South Africa, uh, Brazil, and the rest. They have their own platform. Then you have others that are being told left and right with NATO. They have their own platform. But Africa seems not to have a coordinated voice, depending on whose strings are being pushed and who has the goodies and wants to table and say, I can do this for economy. If you do this, Africa is being told left, right, and said that they, have, they don't have a coordinated platform. NATO comes, they want to go with NATO. The British come, they want to go with British. This other organization comes, they want to go. The South Side Corporation comes, they want to go. So we become disunited. We don't have a common platform in which Africa. But if they start behaving like I saw in the uh, uh, Biden conference and many other conferences, if they speak like they spoke on the Ukraine issue, I said, we are not going to invite this war. We have our own problems. We can solve our own problems. If they start speaking at one vote, I'm telling you, in 2023, the world will listen to Africa. So let Africa keep aside, you know, all those disunited interests, this one is going with the right. Let's speak at Africa. United Africa. Having a common platform and the world will listen to us. It's needed for stakeholders or leaders across the African continent in the year 2023. Uh, We're going to continue talking in the same perspective, uh, Mr. Ndewum. And of course, today we actually are having a retrospective uh, revisiting the major events that occurred and which had the direct uh, influence or effect on the African continent. I want us to actually look at the, 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 the events that occurred at the, the international arena. We want to look at uh, the, the Russia and Ukraine war. And of course, coming back to look at the heightened geopolitical game and we saw at one moment how the continent Africa was entrapped or I always call it a, a, a cut up in the way of the fight by by powers to carve a new sphere of influence in Africa 2023 is coming I think you or Mr. Elijah mentioned there is already that reawakening of the consciousness so what do you think the continent or stakeholders can do in the coming year to, to ensure sure that amidst all uh, everything that is occurring across Africa and across the global world that Africa actually takes advantage of the the, the, the situations or the events to its own uh, uh, maybe to, to see how they can position themselves better and of course get what the, uh, the continent needs to come to your question I will start from what uh, Elijah said it is good that it's not a debate you know but uh, to say Africa has three problems, which is food, education, and security, is just his opinion. Absolutely, and, uh, since we, we have only, the right to uh, opinions, opinion, yeah. I'll only add my own opinion to it. Absolutely. To, yeah. to say that all these three problems he named, um, subtitled under a single problem, which is the problem Bongo, of bad leadership. Bongo, yes. The first problem Africa is having is bad leadership. Now that takes me to your question. Mm -hmm. uh, if Africa was not actually suffocated with bad leadership, such questions would not have been coming up at the end of 2022. Because <clears throat> to imagine a situation where a country like US, one country, I mean one, a country, sits, convokes all men in Africa in the name of president, who are barely working, who are unable to sit up, who are unable to hear or to identify with their audience, to come to U.S. and then respond to one single president tells us that our independence is still a very long way to go. Because I would have expected the contrary. If to say in 2022, Africa was already so much on her own to uh, a level where she could speak a voice of her own. Let me tell you all what happened in U.S. and in the human man. I call it window dressing. Because there is one thing I will shock you. African presidents are known everywhere in the world. 
as celebrities when it comes to making speeches. But after the speeches, what next? Nothing concrete follows. And that's why it becomes very problematic. It becomes very problematic. They are known that celebrated the highest slogan manufacturing companies. Yet, after the slogans and the speeches, what follows? Nothing. They take their flights, they take their delegation, they come home with the envelopes, they sit, they wait for another opportunity for a summit to come up. They, they draft very beautiful, very beguiling speeches. I mean, they deliver until even a white man falls in love with their species. So what do you think yes. is actually important yes. that? We, we, I, I, I want to, I'm coming. Yeah. I, I'm saying that Africa has gone past, the, our generation has gone past the age of speeches and slogans, Clarice. Uh, indeed. I want to think that we should go down practical. We have presidents who cannot manu man manipulate their phones and they cannot be up to date with the new trend of affairs in the world. Now tell me, such presidents will end at the age of uh, at, the, uh, at the level of speeches. Why? Those speeches are not drafted by them. They have specialists who are specialized in the drafting of such, such speeches. They only rehearse, then they go and deliver. They come back and see. It is time African population learns how to rise up. I say no to such people. When I say rise up, I'm not saying rising up I was in terms actually of about yes, coming to I'm them. not saying yeah. rising up in terms of picking guns against the leaders. Mm -hmm. There is there is the absence of citizenship education in the, in the I mean I will use the word in the whole of Africa. Even if some countries have succeeded in emancipating their citizens out of such bondage, it is still to a very low percentage. It is time the African citizens should know that they have to look for other ways, okay, mm -hmm. to go through or to pass their messages to their leaders without necessarily picking up guns. Absolutely. And it yeah. is in this place where I will bring in the word democracy because they have been believing in it that through failed democracy they can unseat uh, some sit tight squirrels in africa in the name of presidents who are actually there so, doing so the service hard. who are actually there doing the service to their citizens in the name of being president now such presidents it is time for them to, to understand that when you are a president there's a social contract between you and your citizens i'm talking in date, in, date, yeah. in generic terms that is from east to west to south, North Africa, or wherever. You saw what happened with Botefica. A man who could barely walk was a president and wanted to remain a president. Yet, in the Un United Nations uh, General Assembly, he offered one of the most beautiful speeches, I think that was 2050 or, or so, that caught the attention of everybody. I want to think that if Africa is actually making a retrospect of 2022, we should be honest enough to say that Africa has failed in upgrading African institutions, institutions. and they have been maintaining individuals who have nothing to offer to the African continent. So it is time for African citizenship to take its place in, a, in form of institutional development mm -hmm. institutional studies because most citizens sit and even criticize a government that if you ask them what is the function what is the role of this 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 Absolutely, institution yeah. in your county they will not be able to tell to you to understand of course and that is where i say the citizens feel because already knowing that we are dealing with dictators it was the role of the citizens to turn to the institution even though some will say the institutions are in the hands of the, these dictators i would say yes to an extent but if the citizens were playing their role clinically i want to tell you that these dictators will not be able to see there as much as they want so africa 2022 in retrospect 
We are highlighting these ones because I'll be ending the program with some few positive notes on the first of Africa. Absolutely. But I want to take this time to highlight where, where we fail. Because when you give birth to a child, the tendency is that the child should be growing. Sure. It is not that the child should be growing now. The child has to be growing upward. Mm -hmm. Now, Africa is our dear and beloved mother continent that we hold so dear to our heart. Now, we, we, we need to pinpoint where we are lacking and start growing from there. If not, we'll keep singing, keep singing the same song, dancing the same rhythm, and remaining on the same spot. And before I give you back the microphone, mm -hmm. I still maintain that it is shameful for a single president to convoke an entire continent and they go bellow before him like a Turk, making speeches to a single president. I think he got to stop with the end of this 2002. Because if it continues, then it keeps giving us the impression that somebody somewhere it's owns superior, us. Yeah? Somebody somewhere controls what we have in our land. Contrary to what uh, my brother was saying a while ago, that the, the president they made beautiful speeches. No, it was a disgrace. And I, I was ashamed. I could not follow it to the end because watching a certain Joe Biden convoke people who go there, some of them even sleep out of their senses. I mean, to me, it, it did not go down well. It, it did not go down well. Uh, of course, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we always say that uh, we have the right to to our opinions. Of course, uh, uh, what we are here because we want to talk constructively and see, like you highlighted, Mr. Andrew, it's not just talking, but of course, going practically. And uh, sure. you highlighted the, the fact that there is the lack of, uh, uh, of civility among citizens uh, across the African continent. But then uh, uh, we we'll actually come to that, seeing how we can inculcate, especially uh, the youthful uh, population of the continent uh, uh, inculcate aspects like skills development uh, among youth people uh, young people to see how they can uh, make themselves uh, useful in their respective uh, nations uh, uh, let's continue with you with you uh, mr uh, elijah enoko if we are talking today uh, highlighting the problems of africa we also talk about the, the economic problems of the continent africa but we are also uh, uh, conversant with the fact that uh, the, the African continental free trade area opened a new phase uh, for uh, um, uh, markets uh, across Africa, for business across Africa. And today we are looking at Africa trading uh, with its server. Uh, of course, to, to highlight, of course, you are a, a researcher on African development. So let's look at uh, the, uh, the African continental free trade area. The successes that have been recorded so far, and what this uh, 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 platform uh, can 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 be used, especially uh, in the year 2023, because when we talk, we, we are looking at how Africa can uh, have feasible or visible development. So, how do you think they can use this uh, African continental free trade area in the year 2023 boost? The development of the continent and of course see how mm -hmm. businesses or markets thrive under the single uh, continental free trade area um before i answer your question Clarice, um, i just want to say that today i want to stay on a positive note i know i've spent a lot of my time lampooning africans and african leaders but i want to cut them some slack today in terms of what they can do i just want to be a little bit um, solution focused because we can spend all our time trying to highlight the failures of Africa, which we've been doing all along. And it's necessary that we do that, to highlight where uh, the continents and leadership and all what have failed. But if we do not supply solutions, what can be done? What is the way forward? Then we are not doing a service to our people. If we remain at the level of critics and not become solution focused while we are criticizing, then we are not doing a service for people. It is true, we have numerous, almost incredible challenges in Africa. When you talk about sit tight leadership, you're talking about uh, people who can barely read or hold their phones, whatever it is, we see those problems every day. But what is the little drop of water in the ocean that we can bring? What is that touch light that can you know, shine in the whole dark to say that thing? It's dark here, but we can shine some light and say, these are positive things that we can pull on and encourage. Sometimes, you know, they say in, in, in Africa that when you beat a child, I mean, they say you don't 
threw out the child with the dirty water, something like that. You watch a child, you throw out the dirty water, you see the child. So that's why my objective of what we're trying to do here. You ask about the African uh, free trade uh, argument. That is, I want to make it very clear. That is a gigantic project that if implemented with African countries, Europe will be as well. North America will be as well. South America will be as well. Because we are dealing with 53 countries with an economy. I'm talking about GDP here. I'm not even talking about the mineral resources. Just the GDP. We're talking about the hundred of fifty-three trillion dollars African economy that we don't. Then if you want to talk about resources, I mean the ones that are not being exploited on the ground. We're talking about the richest continent in the whole wide world. That's what we are talking about here. So let's put things into perspective and put numbers behind what we are talking about. And if this gigantic economic block can implement this African free trade agreement, where goods come within the African continent, let me make it very clear that the African free trade agreement does not include countries out of Africa. It doesn't mean that European countries are going to come and dump their goods in Africa. No, it doesn't mean that North American companies are just going to, going to come and dump their goods in Africa. No, it is African free trade agreement for African countries alone, because, you know, we've had this discussion with Africa, you know, that it's difficult for a Nigerian or Cameroonian even to do business with his next door neighbor. It's easier for me to do business with a different country, even out of Africa, than for an African country to do business with the other one. Because there are so many barriers, tariffs, transportation, infrastructure, or whatnot. But I don't want to dwell on those barriers. I want to dwell on positive today. If, number one, the African Free Trade Organization or Free Trade Union can start by establishing the African Development African Bank, which is part of this argument. It's on paper, but the infrastructure and everything that's supposed to be established by bank that's going to take care of the trade, is going to take care of the goods, is going to take care of national removing those national borders, is going to take care of free trade, is going to take care of all these barriers that are even trade between African countries. Do you know the amount of oil that's produced in Nigeria? I'm talking about palm oil. I'm not talking about crude oil. But do you know how many countries export the same product? Do you know the amount of rice that's produced in some other countries in Africa? But yet, those countries prefer to export from Europe the same thing that is being produced in some other African countries. If we have this inter-African continent trade, we are not going to need those from Europe. We're not going to need those from North America. We're not going to need the cereals from Russia and Ukraine. Because Africa is still suffering the loss. I mean, suffering from drought today because we pay Russia and Ukraine for grain. Because of that war now, the price of all those products have gone up. But if we have African countries supply other African countries, we're not going to need that. So just the impact of that African free trade organization being put into active participation in the African economy is going to go a long way. But the problem, like you know, we talked over the years, is that some days when we African countries make policies, they remain in the cupboards. The implementation becomes a problem. So, number two, if you look at African countries, you know, I mentioned some time ago, the problem that we see today is that in, within Africa, you have the half you have the hard knots. You have those that are war torn. You have those that are, you know, peaceful. So the fear within the African continent and within that organization is that those that are relatively stable are probably going to be exporting, you know, their war according to quotes. Their problems are all well known in terms of that future. Those are some of the musings that we've heard, you know, complaints from those other countries that are most about, oh, no, this uh, free trade is going to open the floodgates for some of these poor countries export some of their poverty into our own country and all whatnot. But those are things that can easily be discussed and take some balance to put in place. For example, you see what's happening in Equatorial Guinea. You see how Cameroonians are being forced and Cameroonians, Nigerians and people from other countries. That is the year that some of those countries are having in terms of resistance to the African free trade. But if African leaders can start speaking with one voice, that's why I said from the beginning, what they did about the war in Russia is an evidence that we can solve our own problem. We can stand up as one people, 
four coalition around one common objective and become a formidable, a formidable force to reckon with when it comes to our relationship with the rest of the international community. But the problem that we have is that we do not have that cohesion. We do not have that common platform as Africans. This one speaks its own thing, and this one speaks its own thing, and we're disorganized. So in 2023, if Africans can come together, look at all what has been on paper, the African free trade, start from the number one, African, African bank. We do have an African Development Bank, but African Development Bank is not the bank that is supposed to take care of this argument. It is the African bank, formation of African bank, that is supposed to be in that 2063 argument that was had in Lagos, when they start those infrastructure, putting them in place, then we start seeing all the parts and pieces of that African free trade being put in place. We remove all those barriers. It becomes easy for somebody in Nigeria to trade with somebody in the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, uh, all these other countries. It becomes easy to establish your businesses across these lines. Do you know that it is almost difficult for somebody in Cameroon to get a visa to go to a country within Africa, as opposed to somebody in Africa to get a visa to come to the Western world. And me, I'm talking within the African zone. So when those barriers are moved and people have free transportation of goods and services, it becomes a bonus for the African continent. Why? Let me explain this in economic terms. Because if you look at the GDP of African countries, I was talking to another platform a couple of days ago, and I may mention that. What is killing Africa in terms of debt? It's not Africa is boring a lot. Every country in the world borrows. But what is killing us is that Africa borrows at an exorbitant interest rate and they spend all their time servicing those debts, servicing the interest, not even the loan, the interest in those debts. The rest of the world goes to the IMF, borrows at almost nothing, and they're able to contain whatever interest it is. If you have an African bank, all these interest rates and all these strings attached are completely eliminated. They will have a model like what we have in the Islamic bank. If you go to the Islamic bank, they give you a loan. There's no interest, almost zero interest attached. Africa will be able to develop. But when we have this Britain was institution instituting draconian measures on the African continent, we will be in a death trap for a very long time. So again, Africa needs to expand on the platforms, on the policies that they have initiated, and let those policies become a reality. Then, 2023 will be, you know, the springboard for us to do many other things now. So the problems uh, uh, that have been identified in the year 2022, uh, we are co going to continue in the same perspective, looking at uh, the uh, integration of the African continent and looking at the obstacles of these integrations, why anticipating or, or proposing solutions that Mr. Elijah just mentioned. If Africa comes together, if, of course, trade barriers or, or other abs uh, obstacles uh, actually derailing uh, the, the, the smooth function of, uh, of of businesses across the continent Africa uh, then uh, uh, it, it will be a step ahead towards promoting integration and of course promoting development on every level what is your own uh, perspective on this well, that's something we have been dating for for a very long time indeed, uh, indeed to do away with trade barriers borders you have to go to Congo you need a passport blah 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 all that now like uh, you know that there's the, the, the first thing again, the African should should be this mindset of at times wanting to be optimistic when that optimism cannot provide a solution. Look, there's a difference between being optimistic for something that works and being optimistic for something that will never work. <laughs> Let so, us understand better. Yes. Yeah. For example, my brother is very optimistic. He wants to stay on a positive line. But there are some African problems that you need to keep criticizing and giving the solutions every day. Whether they like, whether some people like it or not, whether those who are there, they like it or not, it is like that, Clarice. For example, you cannot be optimistic that you want to provide all the solutions. At, at the same time, we are talking about borders that you cannot live from one, border freeze problems in Africa that you cannot move from here to Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Nigeria without using a passport. That's a problem, isn't it? Okay. We think 
after saying all we are saying, we should be questioning African Union and actually the role it has been doing to Africa. Because I am one of those people who have ever who have actually for a very long time believed that it exists in name and paper, but in functionality it doesn't exist. Because all these things we are saying here, we are not the policy makers. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. It is just a service that we are running Africa to give them what we think would be a proposition. And those who matter, those who are in the, at the corridors of power, if they refuse to implement them, we don't have what it takes to go and hold them. We don't know where it pains the most to hold them so that they can do it by force. So, all what we say here at the end of the day remains our opinion. At times, the opinions are taken silently. They have been implemented without even telling us again. Of course, when the implementation takes place, we feel it. Indeed, and we yeah. know that that is the echo, that is the feedback of what we have been talking for the whole year. Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to your question squarely, can Africa come together and surpass her difficulties? The answer is simple. But then at this point, where will greet permit them to sit together? Because they know if they come back, if they were to maybe adopt an African currency, let's look at it from the economic point of view, a common African currency. Uh, some presidents will say no. It means that what I used to gain uh, from trading with France, I will no longer gain it. What I used to gain from trading with Portugal, US, I will no longer gain it. You see that at that point, it makes it very difficult for them to speak with one voice, speak one language, come together in one accord and deliver Africa. So, whether we like it or not, we speak for the whole day, it boils back to one thing. And I earlier said it. Leadership is the problem. Now, if African leadership cannot have common characteristics, if they maintain the heterogeneous way of doing things, I remain a French colony because that's one of the line of division. You remain a British colony. No, I was colonized by this. No, I want to remain with my colonial master of this nature. I want to, I want to. Forgetting to know that the Ubuntu spirit that before the white man came that is what governs the African man I am because you are uh, yeah. you are because I am he long departed from us since the day our leaders decided not to save the immediate population but to go back and save the colony master so I think as a way forward in this domain mm -hmm. our leaders need to put their population first before the colonial master. Look, in the U.S. for even with the U.S. foreign uh, policy, the U.S. citizen comes first. First, indeed, yeah. First. The U.S. interest comes first before anything. I want to think that. I want to take this platform to appeal to the conscience, to the consciences of the African leaders, to put Africa first, put African population first. Even all the monies that at times you people in Brazil, you steal, you launder it to the Western world, bring it back. If you must steal, save it back in your country. Save it back in your continent. Let capital flight separate from us this 2022 as we are facing out. We are not refusing to steal because it is a syndrome that is already in the blood stream of many of African leaders. Steal it. Let it circulate in Africa. At least, avoiding capital flight will help you and I indirectly or directly. Indeed. Because when it goes out, it is not to our service again. So I want to think, uh, for time constraint, the topic is vast. Indeed, you know, yeah. I want to appeal to African, to the consciences of the African leaders. Now this is start to think Africa, act Africa, and lead Africa first. To think that we get anything when we place the Western world 
ahead of our citizens because you are there in the first place because the citizen is there you are not there because the western citizens are there if we if the citizens are not there you then there. you will not be there and you have nobody to lead so you only lead when the people are there so keep the people first Indeed, uh, putting the people first uh, uh, is uh, the, the plight uh, that uh, Mr. Andum, of course, uh, stood there. As we continue to look at uh, the uh, activities or events that marked the uh, African continent uh, in the year 2022, we are culminating uh, the year entering 2023. What prospects for Africa? Uh, and uh, the war at large, uh, we have few minutes to be together again. Uh, we continue with you, uh, Mr. Elijah Inoku, where we are going to talk uh, something else. Uh, we know that uh, the events have occurred, uh, uh, especially at international level, uh, actually attacked what I, uh, I call uh, international cooperation and, of course, putting it at stake. So what do you think? Because uh, it, is, it is very uh, clear that there is need for, for cooperation, especially uh, co uh, positive or win-win cooperation to occur among nations of the world. Uh, so how do you think uh, we can put in, uh, uh, an end uh, to the, the crisis that have uh, attacked uh, or put uh, international cooperation uh, on the uh, balance or hanging uh, as we enter 2023. Uh, something that I do with my notes. Um, it's true that leadership in Africa is a problem. But ladies and gentlemen, it is not as simplistic as you think. Governance is a complicated issue. We do know that leadership in Africa is a problem. I want to give an example. Look at Ghana. Ghana, than we speak, it's one of the most, I mean, the least corrupt countries in Africa. One comes to corruption and leadership problems. It's been there for about the past two presidencies or so. But Ghana, as we speak, has just gone under the structural adjustment program of the army because they could not cope. So it's simply saying leadership in Africa is going to solve a problem. The institutions that are there are stacked against Africa. If you have good leadership, Africa is going to go beyond that. So it is not as simplistic as, like, oh, simply because you know, it's true. The leadership in Africa is brought back. But the problems that Africa is facing go beyond leadership. Ghana went on a plan for structural adjustment program, but that's the young president that has been going all over the world and say Africa should stop borrowing. Why? Let me explain a little bit. When every country in the world borrows, there is no, borrowing is not a problem. Every country in the world borrows. But who do you borrow from? And what interest rate do you borrow from? Who controls the structure? Who controls the adjustment that you're going to make when you borrow? Who leads the programs that you and your borrow are going to invest in? If you do not have economic sovereignty, that's what I keep saying. It doesn't matter how good your nation is, just going to be in problems. Ghana has done everything right when it comes to leadership, but they found themselves in very tough economic position. They had to go back to IMF and go under the draconian structural adjustment program and borrow money. Now the IMF is the one monitoring and managing the Ghanaian economy. Tell me, are they managing it for the interest of Ghanaians? Of course not. Of course not. So it is not as simplistic as you think. It's a complex issue that needs both leadership, as you said, I agree. We talked about it with Lampuna leaders that are sitting out and whatnot. But let's also make sure that we are not undoing our own progress. Because recently, I mean, last year I met with my prime minister of Canada. And one of the things I wanted to know from me is what are the plans for your country? This, the one or not, I'm not going to be telling that oh, we have a sick type president who doesn't want to do anything. I need to at least present some sort of a positive image of the country or what we can do or what the country can do or what Canada can do. For my country, we know those problems. I'm not the one going to be projecting a negative image of my country. Well, then I want to make sure that I present him something that he can see for his country in this world. So again, the point trying to make is that why we lampoon our own leaders for what they're doing, let us understand that it's a complex problem. There are so many institutional barriers that are set against Africa. I give an example here: that when a Western country goes to the IMF, Britain was issued to borrow money. They will borrow at 0.5 percent. An African goes to the same victim work institution to borrow money, they borrow at 10 percent. We will borrow those huge sums of money at 10 percent. 
what end up happening is that you're going to spend most of your time setting the interest on that note. You're servicing the interest on that note. Tell me what kind of development agenda you're going to build based on that. It's going to be non existent. So when you have Africans thinking of the same thing, building an African bank that is going to suffice the African needs of loans, investment, and whatnot, is going to wake us from this drunkenness of the World Bank and this greater world institution. Whether you have good governance or bad governance, if you do not have your own economic independence, you won't survive it. That is the reality in Africa. So Africans should start thinking in those terms of having their own independent institutions that are going to foster their own development and see into the world of the economy. And secondly, secondly, if we go to the end of our this money, we'll go to whatever private institution, go to China and borrow this money. The gains, whether it's interest or development, whatever that accrues from that, does not go to Africa. It goes to those countries from where we borrow that money from. As I said before, every country in the world borrows. Borrowing is not the problem. There is no country that survives without borrowing. The United States borrows, China borrows, all countries borrows. But again, our institutions did not suffice to help us maintain a good economic balance. Now, to answer your question, how do we go into cooperation with the rest of the world? Africa needs to have partners. The problems we have in Africa, for example, like the problem that Francophone Africa are having with France is not because they don't want to partner with France. It's not because France is a bad country. No, it is because the policies of France and Africa are diagrammatically counterproductive to the development of Africa. That's what people see. They say, wait a minute, we think that we're supposed to be equal partners. So, to answer your question, the African Union needs to be a partner on the world stage to cooperate with the rest of the institutions. Forget about the BRICS. Forget about NATO. Forget about whatever regional institution that happens in the West. The African Union needs to have a colossal impact on the world stage because right now, we've already talked about it. I don't want to go lampooning them. We know that they took that build up. We know that. That is the kind of cooperation that we want. They need to stand to with the rest of the world. They need to cooperate with the world, rest of the world. They need to bring the problems of Africa to the forefront and also bring the strength of Africa. We all know 30% of arable land. When I say arable land, it's about cultivable land that you do not need manure, or fertilizer, or whatever it is. It's in Africa. The whole world, 30% is in Africa. If Africa will dwell just on that first, because when I talked from the beginning that the priority of Africa can be summed up in three education, uh, food, and insecurity, there are other things that boil down to that. But we're talking about the top three. If Africa could have an agenda that says these are our top three issues, if you are a French company trying to do logging in, in Mante, let's make sure that in that Mante, there are policies from the Manfred Council, the policies from the uh, Southwest Council, whatever it is called, that are going to make sure that before you lock those rules, institutions need to be built, roads need to be built, the people need to be consulted, conservation institutions need to be built. When you have functional institutions within a country that guarantees such a, a cohesive environment, these international corporations, they, they know who to deal with. But the problem we have now is that it's a no man's business. It's a free for all business. This one comes, this with the government, takes their own money, does their own thing. And at the end of the day, the local population do not feel the impact of the resources that they have. So if we have those functioning institutions, whether you are cooperating with the British World institutions, you are cooperating with whoever it is, because, you know, some people might not know, it is not just countries that deal with IMF and the British World institutions. No. You can have regional councils, monthly council, Berlin council, and also dealing with those institutions and make sure that all regional development is being taken care of. But we do not have. So if we have those institutions in place, Clarice, I'm telling you, in 2023 and beyond, that will not be where they are today. So let's have institutions in place that can go into partnership with these other organizations and work hand in hand so that we can enhance the development of African nations.
Well, we actually have just two minutes. Uh, one last word from you uh, before we go. Last word, repetition of what I've said. Any African, be it a leader or just a citizen of this continent, if you love Africa, before you post any act, wherever you are, you find yourself in each domain that you have to offer services to the people. Ask yourself, will the consequences push Africa? ahead in this light we will not have people who think about themselves and not the continent permit me to say happy new year to your management and to you and it's true that it's your first time i'm sitting on your platform absolutely yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're so ending the year together a happy new year to you, Thank you. to your management and to my trio daughters the home kelly the home keller and the home karen and I'm wishing all the people of Cameroon, especially those who went through tough times in 2022, especially in Northwest and Southwest, to tell you people that hope is not lost. Mm -hmm. Tough times last, but tough people, they never yeah. last. I mean, tough times never last, last but tough indeed, people, indeed, indeed. they last. In one spirit, we are moving into 2023, God willing. Indeed, uh, positively moving to 2023. I thank you, Mr. Doom, uh, for being a part of the program today. Of course, we are ending uh, 2022 together to say that you, this is the first time I'm actually hosting you uh, on the, the program Views and the Continent, of course, on Africa Media Television. Uh, coming back to you to say thank you, Mr. Elijah. Just one uh, one word before we, we go uh, as we put an end to today's edition of the program. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, we can't have him, but then I continue to say thank you to you, Mr. Elijah Inwakua, a researcher with Lakes University on African uh, Development. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, uh, for the great insight uh, on uh, this uh, very important topic that touched on the uh, major trends which characterized uh, the African continent in the year 2022, which I said 2022 was the year of identifying problems and now 2023 is the year of providing practical solutions to those uh, uh, problems uh, uh, facing uh, or faced by Africa. I take this opportunity of course to wish you all uh, a happy new year 2023 still in advance uh, hoping that uh, uh, we will be together next year to continue to talk constructively about issues concerning Africa and the global world wishing you a beautiful moment in the company of our transmissions bye bye for now Et c'est mon très faible. Pour moi, le plus important était que mes enfants et mes proches puissent avoir des Je faisais personnellement mes études avec des combattants. Zamjai, combattant du Mont Akadirov, était parmi les derniers à être envoyé dans la zone de l'opération spéciale. Je sais donc qu'il était jusqu'à ce qu'il reçoive l'ordre de partir. Et je sais à quel point il était inquiet de ne pas recevoir cet ordre. Il s'est encore et encore au président de l'Afrique pour lui donner la permission d'y aller. Quand l'ordre a enfin été donné, il est en train de plier ses affaires et de quitter son régiment. Je suis allé lui dire au revoir. J'ai demandé « Comment tu Comment te sens-tu » Il a répondu « Ahmed, tu ne sais pas à quel point nous avons soif de quoi, à quel point nous voulons partir à l'opération militaire spéciale, avec quel point nous y allons. » Il rêve donc d'y aller. On est proche désormais, c'est que le clôt contour. Les gars prêts à tout le seul problème, 
et de savoir comment les arrêter. Chaque fois, après nous libérer un quartier, ils disent Allez, on avance encore un bâtiment, de plus, de plus. Et moi, je leur attendez, lorsque je m'occupe pas de nous devons le sécuriser sur tout fond, qu'on ne puisse pas traiter. Nous qui en chose. Ramzan Kadirov nous a fixé l'objectif de sauver les cibles à nos ennemis. 